Hi, and welcome to the Electronics and Programming Beginner's Guide. If you haven't noticed right away, uh, the locale is a little different, and that's because I've recently moved. And that's also why I haven't done any videos recently, because if you've actually moved, it really sucks and it takes a really long time. It's very consuming in the process. Also, if you haven't noticed right away, I do have some uh, new lights. They're more uh, reminiscent of studio lights, and I'll show you uh, those in a later video, because what I've been trying to do is get the best lighting and to minimize the glare on the board as best I can, and we'll see how well I did. Uh, let me know if you have any uh, comments or suggestions, of course, down below. So today we're going to talk about something uh, gross, nasty, disgusting, something very taboo, something that nobody ever wants to talk about, and that is C programming pointers. Pointers are very uh, difficult to understand. It's kind of a concept that's foreign to us. And me personally, uh, after I took a programming class at school, I didn't still quite entirely understand pointers. It was only when I started working on uh, microcontrollers and embedded type systems when uh, pointers actually finally uh, coalesced and made sense in my head, and I'm going to try and uh, teach that approach to you today. Before we delve into uh, the meat and potatoes of pointers, we have to get some concepts out of the way. Although these concepts don't directly relate to pointers, they are the building blocks that let you understand pointers later on, and we have to be sure to grasp these concepts before we delve into what pointers actually are. The first of these concepts is the idea of a memory space. Uh, this is kind of just a very generic layout of a memory space for a microcontroller, and if you've ever looked at a data sheet for a microcontroller, this is usually what they look like. What goes into a memory space? Well, obviously, memory. The two uh, most common memories in a memory space would be your RAM. That is where a program stores information while it's running, and then you have the flash. The flash is where the program is actually stored, and uh, Commands from the flash are copied into either the core or the RAM to get executed, but there are lots of other uh, parts and pieces that can go into memory space, but don't necessarily have to. Everybody does it differently. Uh, sometimes a memory space is continuous, meaning that the RAM uh, is up here, let's say, for example, and the flash is down here. Sometimes they're not consecutive, where uh, stuff is kind of piecemealed together. Beyond just the RAM and the flash, uh, memory space can also incorporate other things like, for example, the stack uh, or all of the configuration registers that are in a microcontroller that you poke to uh, configure the microcontroller to do stuff. Uh, more on that later. The thing too that needs to be grasped, grasped about a memory space very specifically, is that a memory space is broken down into the smallest accessible piece of information, which is usually a byte. And each one of those bytes in a memory space have an address. The address is so that information can be found later. The idea being is that when your program stores a variable, it doesn't actually use the name of the variable like you wrote in your program, you know, uh, if you have an integer uh, that's called x. The, inter the x name doesn't really exist. What actually exists in the background is the address of where x is stored. And so it's something to understand that every single, if you kind of chunk this out, every single byte in the memory space has this proverbial address that's attached to it and the entire memory space has these addresses. Now, the second concept we need to uh, put together for pointers is the idea of variable attributes. That's just what I call it, but uh, there's a, a bunch of different names for it. So, so your 
welcome to look up what they are, etc. But the idea is that whenever you declare a variable in a program, there are certain attributes attached to it and we need to kind of understand a little bit about them. So back to that integer x, let's say we're working in an 8-bit uh, architecture and so an integer is usually 16 bits. And so what happens is you write your you know, int x semicolon and so now the compiler will go through and as it uh, passes this line, it will generate a variable and attach certain attributes to it. So the first attribute that we need to understand is the size. And we already talked about that. And in an 8-bit architecture, an integer is generally 16 uh, bits. And so you will have two 8-bit blocks of memory associated to uh, this integer. Uh, the next attribute is the address, and that's what I was talking about earlier. So uh, the address will always refer to the first byte of this variable. And so you will have something like, oh, this is going to be the address, because we need to know where this variable is stored so we can access it later. Uh, then we have the size. You know, we already talked about that the integer is uh, two bytes. This is the size of that variable. And then uh, after that, uh, there are some uh, things like, for example, well, is this integer signed or unsigned? That uh, tells the compiler and how to treat the first uh, bit to, uh, as it does math, etc., so on and so forth. But uh, the really important concept here, let's say the compiler knows that it's an integer, which describes how to treat this number. The compiler knows the size, which is two bytes in this case. And the compiler knows the address, which is where this variable is gonna be located. So now that we've gotten those two concepts out of the way, let's talk about pointers. What is a pointer? A pointer is a special variable, a container that uh, has an attribute of storing instead of information, it stores an address. That's it, that's all that pointers are. But that concept of storing an address is foreign, A, and B, uh, it can become very powerful once you understand what the pointer actually does. How do you declare a pointer? A pointer is declared very simply that, similar to how we just declared the uh, integer here, you go int, and then you do a star, and then you do x. And that's it, now you have declared a pointer. Some things that uh, we'll uh, flesh out a little bit later, but this pointer x, stores the address of an integer. That's it, that's exactly what we've declared here. How do you work with an integer, uh, with a pointer, sorry. Uh, the way you work with a pointer is just like you would with an integer. And don't confuse that with the definition I have here because even if you had, let's say, float uh, y, you would still work with y just like you would with an integer. You work with it with whole numbers and actually an unsigned integer to be very specific that uh, you obviously can't have negative addresses and so you can't store a negative number uh, in a pointer and you can't store any kind of decimal. So even a float is still has all of the properties of working with it as an unsigned integer. And so what you can do is go x equals 7. And a 7 will be stored in x. This, doesn't act, this operation doesn't actually particularly make sense, and I'll uh, explain that further on. But for the time being, all you need to know is that pointers can be manipulated just like integers can. And so again, you can do, let's say, uh, x plus plus plus. 
which would then turn the 7 into an 8. Again, all the operations of how uh, unsigned integers work. Now, how do pointers interact with other variables? So, again, we start with an int pointer of x, and let's say we have a int variable of z. What you can try and do is go x equals z. And if your compiler is worth the code that it's written with, this should generate at least a warning, if not a compilation error, so the thing should barf, as I like to put it, meaning that it will tell you that something is wrong. Well, why is something wrong? The uh, variable x and variable z are not compatible variables. Why? Because x is a pointer, it stores an address, and z is an integer, it stores a number. And an address and number are not compatible. And so how do you deal with this? Well, there is another special little character that's uh, built in. Let me erase that. And that is the ampersand. So if you go x equals ampersand z, this is a correct statement. What does this statement mean? x is a pointer and it's looking to receive an address. What the ampersand does is instead of giving us the number that's stored in z, which would happen if you do it without the ampersand, the ampersand tells it to, instead of giving me the number, give me the address of z. Tell me where z is located and then that value gets stored in x. Now, I understand that pointers still don't make sense at this point because, you know, we're just grabbing the address of z and storing it in x. Why does that matter? But just hold on for a little bit longer. We still have just a few uh, more things to get out of the way before we really uh, understand what the pointer is for. Now the next thing to uh, kind of get out of the way is, let's say we already did this, we have a pointer x, we have an integer z, and we store the address from z into x. But now we do, let's say, a float uh, pointer y. And then we try and do y equals x. And again, if the compiler you're using is good, this should cause it to barf. At least generate a warning, if not an error. Again, the reason being is that uh, x is an integer pointer, and y is a float pointer. And even though both of them store an address, x stores the address of an integer and y stores the address of a float and those are two different things this should generate you an error now here's where things get really interesting and that is let's suppose we uh, took the integer z and made it five so we did z equals five very simple thing, we stored a 5 in z, z is an integer, everything is happy and healthy. But now we did this operation where we did star x equals 7. What did that do? Well, the star operator does something very special. It again modifies, kind of like the ampersand did here, uh, how the compiler the, uh, treats the attributes of uh, the variables. What the star does is the star tells the compiler that, remember how we drew the uh, the integer uh, variable here that we have your two bytes and then the address. Well, what the star does is the star will tell the compiler, take the address that's stored in here, 
inside the variable and actually use it as the address of where the variable is located. What does that do? Well, if after this line star x equals to 7, we were to check what z is, z has become 7. Because while the address of z is stored in x, anytime you use the star on x, x and z become interchangeable because x can point to where z is. Um, a different way to think about it is if you've ever played Portal. Uh, what this relationship does uh, by storing the address in x, you create a portal and you can reach through the x portal and manipulate z on the other side. So, again, it may not seem like such a grand concept, but it allows x to masquerade, so to speak, as any other integer as long as you store the address of that uh, integer in x. Now some things we can fill in directly after learning how uh, this, these operations work is why did uh, x equal to 5 not make sense? Well, we're interested in x pointing to an integer and uh, unless we've very carefully dissected the memory space and figured out exactly where the compiler put an integer, doing x equals to 5, which points to the mem memory address block of 5 in the memory space, is completely pointless and actually kind of dangerous because you could do manipulations on whatever stored in address 5 and completely crash your program, trash your memory, do all kinds of things that would be haphazard. And so directly putting addresses into a pointer is not recommended. The other thing to uh, understand from this concept is manipulations like x plus plus are okay. They're not fantastic. It's a reasonable way to use a pointer, but the thing that you need to understand is that before we use an operation like x plus plus we need to store the address of a variable into x first because the idea of this operation on a pointer of x plus plus is if you have you know a row of memory blocks and let's say we stored something for x into here Make that narrow. Doing x plus plus just moves you to the next memory block. But <clears throat> the thing to understand here is that if x is an integer pointer, instead of moving you a single memory block, it will actually move you two memory blocks because the operation of x plus plus moves you to the next integer not just the next memory block. And so if we do this correctly, and this is, you know, this is a byte and this is a byte, and we're in an 8-bit system where an integer is two bytes, doing x plus plus will actually move you here. And this holds true for any kind of pointer. Anytime you increment a pointer, uh, the pointer will jump uh, one uh, container size, let's say, uh, forward in the memory space. And so if you have, um, let's say, a double, which usually, a double or long, which usually ends up being four uh, uh, bytes, then uh, this arrow would go instead to here. And so from this behavior of a pointer incrementing across the memory space, we can tease out kind of our first useful example. So suppose we have an integer pointer x and we have an integer array z of five members. What you can do is you can go x equals ampersand z and this will store the address from z into x. 
And after this relationship is formed, uh, effectively star x is equivalent to, and I'm not sort of writing a line of code, I'm just saying that they're equivalent to z member 0. And then you can continue that relationship and you can say that star x plus plus, because this will increment x, and then using the star, to, it solidifies x, and that's going to be equivalent to z1. You know, member array, I guess this would be 2, is equivalent to this. The issue with this example, though, although it's a legitimate example, uh, what ends up happening is that a array is already a pointer. That's how arrays work. That uh, z is already a pointer to the beginning of the address, and actually the ampersand here is redundant, and many compilers will actually let, let you completely omit it, because z without these brackets in the back is a pointer and so x equals z is a legitimate relationship without meaning anything else. And something to note here is that you can also use the brackets operator similar to the way you use the star and the uh, increment. That uh, once x becomes equivalent to z, x bracket 0 is now equivalent to z bracket 0. And so on and so forth, x bracket 1, z bracket 1, etc. These are all equivalent. So nothing that I've showed you so far is very monumental and you know, nothing special. Nothing up until right now that you've done can't be done without pointers. Now, let's do an example of where a pointer becomes ridiculously handy. And so instead of an array, let's, let's change our setup around. Uh, let's suppose we... Uh, Let's suppose we have a pointer of, and it's easier to write it this way, let's say byte. And the reason I say it's easier to write this way because uh, many compilers prefer an unsigned char to be equivalent to a byte instead of a byte. Not a lot of compilers actually accept byte outright, but whatever. And let's say we have a struct of z and uh, I actually don't remember the syntax for a struct exactly. I think uh, struct z, uh, open the bracket, and into the struct we're gonna put some irregular data. And so let's say we have a byte, uh, g, uh, we have a int, um, a, and we have a long oh and then you close the bracket and i think you get a uh, like that and this is just a declaration actually i guess i can i can define it right off the bat and call this uh y and so this is the struct z is a declaration for the struct. And then we define it by saying that it's y. And the reason why I wrote the struct this way is that the struct has a bunch of irregular data in it. And what we want to do is we want to parse through the struct one byte at a time. Let's say you want to generate a serial data stream for your. Your can only send a single byte at a time. And so to send the struct, you would have to deconstruct the struct into individual bytes and then reconstruct it on the other side. Pointers are awesome for this because what you can do is you can take uh, x, so x, uh, 
equals and you typecast. Uh, if you don't know what typecasting is, typecasting is being able to uh, take one kind of uh, variable and conform it to something else. In this case, we can go byte uh, ampersand y, like that. What does this do? What this does is it takes in the address of y and it conforms it to a byte address. And so whereas if we go through the struct, the byte is obviously a byte in size. The integer here is going to be two bytes. So we have three bytes total. And then the long is going to be another four bytes. So it's seven bytes. And so if you were just to take x equals to ampersand y and then incremented one, it would jump at least seven bytes ahead. And uh, there's actually memory alignment issues that we might not be compensating for because Sometimes uh, the compiler will pad this byte with another byte just to make sure that uh, things like the integers and the longs align properly. So it could even be eight and we might not even know it. And so by taking byte here and uh, typecasting uh, ampersand y with it, what we get is that uh, the, uh, first of all, the types match. So uh, the address return here becomes a byte and that matches the pointer here. But what it does now is that let's say we know, for instance, we know that this is seven bytes. Now we can parse this into bytes incredibly easily because we can go x zero, x one, all the way to dot, 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 x uh, six. And just by pulling the information out of each one of these memory locations, and mind you, because we didn't use the plus plus operator, because we used the array like operator, the pointer for X stays at its location. So this is reusable over and over again, that you can just call this uh, set of variables uh, every single time you have to send the struct and you can pull one byte at a time out of this. And then on the receiving end, all you have to do is declare the same struct uh, and uh, put the data back in in exactly the same fashion. You declare the struct, you generate a pointer to it, typecast it to a byte, and then instead of reading the data out, you put the data back into x0, x1, x2, x3, you know, dot, dot, dot to x6. And then when you start to access the data that's in the struct, it's already put back and reassembled in exactly the same way it was found on the other side. This makes, this type of operation makes pointers incredibly useful. Now that we've looked at one really useful uh, thing to do with a pointer, let's dig deeper, let's find some more. The next one here is an operation called pass by reference. Pass by reference refers to passing information in and out of functions. And if you've done any kind of work with functions, uh, you know, what you get is something along the lines of, let's say, int uh, func, let's just call our function func, open it, and then we're passing in some sort of information. Let's say it's also an int uh, g. That's our function. And then in the function, we do stuff with G, yada, yada, yada. It doesn't matter. What are the limitations of this function? The limitations are that the function can only pass back a single item. It can pass back, in this case, an integer. Well, what if you need to pass back two integers? Well, what do you do? You could, let's say, pass back a struct. Such a thing can be done, but it becomes a little bit messier because let's say you need two separate uh, variables passed back independently, not in the struct. You could do it in an array. Similar issue as with the struct. It becomes kind of messy to unpack it on the other side. So what does pass by reference do? Pass by reference is let's say we need to pass back two integers. So what we can do is we can make this void 
meaning it doesn't pass back anything at all. And then we can turn uh, the uh, pointers here uh, into, uh, we can turn, I guess, the variables of the function into pointers. So let's say int g uh, int q. Uh, make it nice and confusing. Oops, star. So when you call this function, what you end up doing is you would call func and then uh, you pass it, uh, you have to pass it the address, so you would pass it ampersand x and ampersand y. What this does is now that you enter the function and you have to do manipulations to x and y, um, I guess in the function it would be g and q. Whenever, let's go with g and q. Whenever you do manipulations to g and q, these manipulations actively affect what x and y are. And at the end of the function, as long as you store your results in x and y, what happens is that uh, the data is, once you leave the function, is already stored in x and y because you did the manipulations to g and q. Uh, this becomes a very powerful tool because you can uh, pass back and forth a whole host of data, etc. You can do the same thing with arrays as well. For example, let's say you have a 50 member array that you need to sort. And uh, afterwards, you're going to do manipulations to it, etc. But if you pass the array by reference to the function, when the function sorts the array and you exit the function, it's the array that you passed to the function that's already been sorted. You don't need to receive out uh, an array and then copy all the data over back to the original array to do uh, further manipulations to it. Another thing to note from that is that whenever you pass something into a function by reference, you do not take out more memory in your RAM. What do I mean by that? Let's say back to that 15 member array example. If you were to pass a 50 member array into a function by value, meaning that you don't have the star right there, when the function begins, uh, the function creates a new array in your RAM and it effectively copies those 50 members out of the one array into the new array that's been created and that eats up more RAM. And when you're talking about embedded systems, particularly really little tiny microcontrollers, that can really cost you, uh, you know, your program not compiling because the compiler can actually tell that, well, if I run the program in this particular order, I'm going to overflow my RAM. And that's if you're lucky. If you're not lucky, what can happen is that you can overflow your RAM and crash your program and have no idea why it's crashing. Because what can happen is that, let's say, you know, your microcontroller only has 200 bytes of RAM. And a uh, you know, if you have a 100 member array and another 100 member array with some other stuff thrown in because those aren't going to be the only variables, you'll end up overflowing the memory. Bad news bears. So that's two more advantages of pointers is that you can pass information in and out of a function by reference which uh, allows you to pass multiple things at the same time. You don't have to just stick to the one as you leave the function. And whenever you pass by reference, if you pass really big things, it doesn't eat more memory because the pointer only, you know, only takes up a few bytes, depending on how the compiler treats it. And then it's able to just reference back to where all of the original data is stored, nothing extra is used. Another great example of where, func uh, where pointers are very useful is that pointers can point to more things than just variables. Because in a microcontroller's memory space, there's lots of other things that have addresses besides uh, 
variables. Another example is a function. A function can actually be pointed to by a pointer. And so, for example, let's say you know we have your you know, standard function void func void. It's a function that takes in nothing and passes out nothing. It just executes some things. Sometimes the some people call these uh, uh, subroutines, I think, subs. But anyway, uh, regardless, you can create a pointer to this, and that pointer declaration declaration looks something along the lines of void uh, star. Let's call this ptr void. And so now we've generated a function pointer that has the same kind of casting is our func function. And so now we can go ptr equals to ampersand func. And ta-da, what you get is that whenever you call ptr with a star, star ptr, it will perform the, exactly the same operation as func. The thing to understand here is that to use function pointers properly, the functions that you're using have to be have to match up in the sense of that you can't have a int func int try to be called by void you know function int because the void, the int here and the void here won't match, et cetera, the functions have to match. But uh, what this unlocks is a very powerful tool because for instance, uh, for one of my uh, I squared C drivers, I actually wrote a interrupt based driver and the interrupt based driver worked entirely off of function pointers. The way it worked was that uh, the interrupt uh, for I squared C, if you've watched my I squared C video, uh, I squared C generates an interrupt after every single event occurs. And so whenever you begin a transmission, uh, you set uh, the uh, start bit to on. And whenever the start bit finishes, the interrupt fires. And so the way it worked is when you uh, began transmission, you would store uh, the function for transmitting the slave address into the function pointer that was sitting in the interrupt. And when the interrupt would fire, I had a little catch in there that checked for bus collisions, just to be sure. If there was a bus collision, you would go off and do other things because you knew you couldn't continue transmission. But if there were no bus collisions, it would call the single generic function. Well, because I had preloaded uh, the send slave address a function into the function pointer, whenever the interrupt would fire after the uh, start bit, it would then call the function for transmitting the slave address. And you go through the function of, for transmitting the slave address, which effectively just copies the slave address into the uh, register uh, for transmission. And then at the end of that function, you load the function pointer uh, for that would have been, let's see here, if you're transmitting for uh, transmitting the data address and leave the function. So next time the function pointer uh, is called, I'm sorry, next time the interrupt is called, what happens is that, again, you check to see if there were any bus collisions, and if there weren't, you would call the function pointer, and the function pointer would already have preloaded the function for sending the data address. And so uh, that function would then check to see if the um, ACK, was asserted, meaning there actually was a slave out there, and assuming that there was, it would then copy uh, the data address into uh, the, the transmit buffer, and then load the function for, uh, you know, the function pointer up with the function for transmitting uh, the first bit of data. And this process just continued over and over and over again that 
every function at the end would load into the function pointer the next function that needed to be called depending on what had occurred. And the interrupt would just call that function over and over again. It made the solution very elegant because you minimize the amount of code that you have to deal with. You can parse it out into little function uh, bite-sized type things. Also, you minimize the overhead because you don't need to have this one giant function that's called all the time where you can get some overhead because you might have to go through some cases or some comparisons and whatnot to make sure that you, you hit the right spot because you could do the same thing with one giant function and a flag that you use to keep track of where you are. But what you run into is that, you know, well, there's probably, I don't know, about a dozen functions that in that get called progressively depending on which steps that you're in. And uh, uh, you would have to go through like a switch case or if kind of comparison, if then else comparison to work your way down. Oh, I'm on, you know, step six out of 12. And that does take some time with the uh, function pointers. What that can do is to eliminate that overhead because you always call pretty much the minimum amount of code necessary to be able to complete the operation. You don't have any of that messy overhead. Another thing that I promised to mention later are the registers that are uh, in the processor for, let's say, configuring things like I2C or UART or toggling registers, etc. They also work with pointers. Why is that? Well, those registers sit in the memory space and the only way to poke at them is by manipulating the uh, registers and so uh, if you're using the uh, standard compiler development environment for your particular microcontroller most of that stuff is generally taken care of for you in nice little wrappers where you can uh, you know you can do like uh, port a equals to zero B zero 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 one I think that's a byte. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, something along those lines. You, you get my drift as far as which would take the uh, least significant bit of port A and go ahead and set it uh, to a 1. And actually, now that I think about this, if you're talking pick microcontrollers, port is actually not the best thing to use. You want to use lat A to set your bits. Assuming that your uh, particular microcontroller is equipped with LAT because not all of them are. The older ones tend to use port, it gets messy. I think I've done a video about it. I don't remember now. But anyway, uh, if you do these manipulations directly, great, you never have to worry about it. But let's say you have to do these manipulations indirectly. You are in a really tiny minuscule microcontroller and you just can't afford the memory to be able to generate all the different permutations of stuff. Uh, let's say you're doing some sort of lighting controller where you've got you know a dozen LEDs that you have to blink, etc. And you're trying to do it on the cheap, so you're using a really tiny micro. Well, LAT A is a pointer and the compiler takes care of it for you in the background, but you could take LAT A, peel the address off it with the name for saying, and store it in a function or even better uh, pass this to a function with the ampersand and manipulate it by reference so you can write a single function where you pass the function a mask and the variable by reference and that function will do the manipulations for you instead of having uh, five different functions for port a b c and d and e i guess if, if i if we're going to go with five where you have to pass the function, you know, fun function A, the mask, and then that function does it for you. You know, you've just reduced that section of the program down to one fifth of what it was before by passing the uh, ports here by reference to the function. And so now 
to kind of bring things to a close, I wanted to talk about uh, basically if you're a Spider-Man fan, it's the great quote of, well, with great power comes great responsibility. And that's incredibly true for pointers because pointers can really get you in trouble if you're not careful and attentive. For instance, if you declare a pointer, the pointer is by default initialized to what's referred to as a null pointer. A null pointer points to the zeroth address of the memory space. The problem is though, there's never anything good sitting at the zeroth address of the memory space and a null pointer will generally cause your program to crash sometimes unexplainably that you your program seems to be running fine etc you happen to call this pointer that hasn't been initialized yet and boom uh, if you're lucky uh, the processor restarts if you're not lucky the processor just outright crashes because it doesn't know what to do and it locks up and everything is very angry the way you can try to track problems like that down is some processors have uh, what are called traps. Uh, traps, uh, whenever invoked, will uh, uh, trap the operation after the crash into a certain process. Uh, usually, uh, what I've done in the past, uh, uh, the one kind of trapping uh, idea is that you actually generate interrupts that are only used for the traps and let's say you turn a light on for a particular trap and so as you enter the interrupt you uh, you know toggle a particular uh, bit so a light turns on somewhere externally on your board etc which it's always a good idea to have leds on your board for debug lots of leds it really helps you later on but anyway uh, as you enter the interrupt you turn a light on and then you go into like a wild one with just nothing in it and so it sits there and spins its wheels because leaving that trap will usually cause your processor to crash completely and restart etc and so it's very useful to kind of trap it and hold it there on the crash to see, oh, LED2 came on. Well, if I look through my notes, you know, the data sheet LED2 is um, a memory space issue. And, oh, a null pointer would definitely cause that. And so now you have to go through and try and figure out uh, how to do it. Uh, the PIC32 uh, had kind of an interesting uh, way of doing it that there was a, a uh, oh, what did they call it? It wasn't an interrupt handler, it was basically a crash handler. I, I can't quite think of the name off the top of my head. And very similar that whenever a crash occurred, it always jumped to that specific location. In contrast with an interrupt based kind of trap, you have specific interrupts for specific events. Let's say a divide by zero doesn't put you into the same interrupt as a, 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 you know, a memory space issue. But in the PIC32, uh, you always jumped to uh, this routine. And in the routine, you had a set of steps that let you identify why the thing crashed because it would trap the codes. And then you kind of sit there in a wild one and spin your wheel. So you could put a little if you know, set of statements in there to be sure that uh, you could identify what the problem was and then turn a light on. Uh, the other thing to understand is with a pointer, it's actually fairly easy to blunder out of where you need to be. Uh, in the case of the array, for example, and this is something I meant to mention earlier, was that the array has an attribute of size of how many members it has, whereas a pointer does not. And so if you attempt to do an, a manipulation on an array that's outside of its size, the compiler will barf at you. It will say, hey, you know, we can't do this. But with a pointer, you can very easily blunder outside of the array and manipulate stuff that you have no idea what you're manipulating and you end up getting weird results. Those kinds of actions are fairly difficult to track down. You kind of have to go through your program with a very fine tooth comb and uh, 
uh, debug it carefully. And so uh, with pointers, you always want to try and have uh, uh, checks and things that, you know, maybe you want to check to see that the uh, pointer is not a null pointer before using it. And if it is a null pointer, you want to uh, uh, exit the routine or, you know, trap the code and show you a little flag to debug the code later on. Uh, or, for example, if you're passing in an array, uh, do pass in also a size of, because that way you know exactly how many members are in the array or the struct, et cetera, that you're passing in, so that the manipulations that you do are bound by that size of, you don't just guess that, oh, I'm always gonna pass in a seven uh, member array, but then accidentally do eight manipulations on it, that kind of thing, et cetera, et cetera. So, so with great power comes great responsibility. Be very careful with pointers because you can get into trouble with them. And sometimes it's incredibly difficult to diagnose. And so with any kind of a good learning type thing, I'd like to do a review of the things that we learned. First, we talked about a memory space. The memory space uh, subdivides all your memory into cells that are a byte size each and each cell has an address. And that's the important part because by knowing the address, that's how the compiler and effectively your program knows where things are stored. It doesn't do it by name. And so then we moved on to variables. With variables, uh, there are attributes such as the address where it's located, its size, the container, uh, and what that variable is. And that's how we kind of jumped into pointers, where a pointer stores an address instead of data. So an integer pointer stores the address for an integer instead of the data that would be the integer. We talked about the manipulations you can do with an integer where you can do all of the same kind of uh, arithmetic as you can with integers, not uh, uh, anything with decimal places. Then we moved on to the idea of that you can take something that already exists and peel the address off of it and store it into <clears throat> a pointer. And then by using that address, you can increment across something with that pointer. <clears throat> Pointers can be typecast that you can change, you can peel the address off of something and change uh, what that address means. And that was in unison with whenever you increment a pointer, that pointer jumps the same amount of spaces as what it's pointing to. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you have an integer and your integer is two bytes, if you increment the integer pointer, you're gonna jump two bytes. If it's just a byte, you'll jump one byte. And if, a, let's say, a long, you'll jump four bytes. Uh, we talked about that pointers can point to other things besides just <coughs> variables such as functions. And that has some uses because you can generically call a function <clears throat> to do things and preload a pointer into it <clears throat> for uh, what you need to call next. And finally, we kind of wrapped up with uh, pointers can also be used to point to stuff in <clears throat> the memory space for changing uh, the settings in the processor. And there was that group warning for uh, make sure to use pointers carefully. If you have any questions or comments about pointers, you're always welcome to comment down below. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the uh, segment, uh, I did get some new lights and I'm still gonna, I don't think I'm 100% happy with how I'm still being lit. I think there's a lot less glare on the board. Uh, but uh, I think I can still reduce it down further, so I have to mess around with that some more. I'll probably do a video on that. Uh, again, please let me know what you thought of the lighting, because so, uh, I'm curious, because it's one of those things that you're your own worst critic, and you know, let's see what you guys think about it. Uh, thank you for watching.